Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, a really, really big thank you for, for Ariella for, for coming. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, it's really wonderful to have you here. Um, and I think I wanna just start by introducing uh, parts of the reason why we've invited you and kind of the connection we have in our, un our summer school unit and, uh, and your work. Um, you know, because your work has been very influential, influential to us. Um, in our unit, we kind of look at the, the image as this political construct, and we kind of uh, work through it in order to, to unveil certain realities and truths that are, uh, that are hidden by the image or hidden in particular ways within its, within its space. So we kind of work around spatializing the image in order to then, you know, go forward in order to reveal these truths. Um, and uh, we saw, you know, we saw kind of a connection with with the way you spoke about the imperial image, um, and the way you spatialize them as well. Um, and I'm sure, kind of, you, we were, I think, with a conversation that that we're probably kind of going to touch uh, on on a lot of these concepts. I'm just going to kind of give a quick bio to those who, who, who aren't familiar uh, with you. So it's, uh, you know, Ariella is, is a professor at Brown University. She's an expert in visual culture and photography. Her research focuses on how visual mediums can narrate history, specifically the history of political regimes and zones of conflict. One of her renowned books that she's going to be talking about today as well, uh, Potential History, Unlearning Imperialism, focuses on photography's active and operative not simply observational role in the history of imperialism. The Palestinian struggle has been her, one of her primary case studies where she positions her teachings within the context of colonization, going beyond the ideological framework of it portrayed as a history of a conflict between two national uh, entities. She's an author, filmmaker, art curator, theorist uh, of photography and visual culture. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And I, I mean, for the audience, we're gonna try to kind of we agreed we engage in a conversation where perhaps through which kind of area I can reveal to you uh, some of her, uh, you know, her work and her research and, and, and we'll try to kind of see where that conversation goes. I don't know if you want to say a few words uh, in the beginning or I kind of lead up with my first question. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Jumana and Khaled, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be in conversation and to be in conversation with what you're doing in this, you know, uh, forum. Um, no, you know, maybe I can say a few words about, you know, uh, Potential History, uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. So Potential History is a book that I, you know, spent 10 years in writing. And, uh, you know, I... Um, it focused at the beginning on Palestine, uh, uh, where I was born. I was born uh, to believe that I'm an Israeli Jew, and this is part of the research. Uh, I was born to believe that I'm an Israeli Jew because Israel was created, right? Israel was there when I was born. So everything in my surrounding reflected that I am an Israeli because I was born in Israel. And this is how, you know, uh, imperialism crafts, uh, uh, you know, the plunder, crafts the plunder and the normalization and legalization of the theft of lands, of cultures, etc. And uh, I bring this to the conversation first because it shaped, you know, my research. And second, because this forum is a forum of people who are mainly uh, uh, interested in architecture. And I think that architecture has a very big role in normalizing settler colonial states. Uh, so I was born to believe that I am an Israeli Jew and it took me uh, many, many years, you know, to uh, uh, not only criticize the regime of uh, Israel, which is, let's say, fairly easy comparing to understanding that it is not unavoidable that I will be Israeli for all my life. So uh, uh, struggling against uh, uh, the reflection 
of the identity, the reflection uh, of architecture, the reflection of the built environment in the way that people are being, you know, I would say, even kidnapped or socialized to believe that they are uh, 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 those imperial agents and it is unavoidable. I think that there is a very big role uh, to architecture, uh, uh, to history, and to all the other liberal professions. Uh, they participate in creating this givenness this obviousness that we are citizens of settler colonial states. So I was born to believe that I was an Israeli Jew and it took me years to uh, uh, refuse to recognize myself in this category, which means to refuse to see architecture as unavoidable, refusing to see photography as, you know, a kind of neutral device that you hold in your hands and you have a right to go to roam around and take pictures of every place because it's yours, because this is how you were trained under your professional capacity. So potential history is a manifesto against history. It's a manifesto against liberal arts. It's a manifesto against imperial rights. Potential history is an attempt to say that, uh, you know, every place on this planet as it's for, uh, 1492, if 1492 stands for several, you know, major uh, events, uh, uh, like, you know, the uh, uh, invasion of the new world with quotation mark or the uh, uh, enterprise of enslavement or the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from uh, uh, the Iberian Peninsula and trying to destroy this uh, Judeo-Arab world and to replace it by a Christian uh, 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 white world. So if 1492 stands for all these, you know, uh, historical events, 1492 uh, uh, reiterates under the imperial regime in different places. So for Palestine, it's 1492 is 1948. For Algeria, for example, it's 1492 is uh, uh, 1830 or 1870 and on and on and on. So potential history is an attempt to delve or to dwell in these 1492 of different places and try to see what this moment uh, prevents us from uh, recognizing uh, what, uh, what this moment you know, destroyed as political formations, as cultural formations, and as modalities of sharing the world differently with others. So potential history is an attempt to say that we don't have to move forward, but rather we have to undo all these uh, um, uh, fossils of settler colonial and racial capitalist regimes. So maybe I'll end here and I'm happy to. I think uh, that, was a, that was a wonderful kind of expansive introduction. I think that, that there's a lot to go on, but I, I wanna kind of maybe take a step back and maybe work from the camera outwards. So, so I'm, I'm gonna, you know, this is one of, you know, you're, you're often quoted uh, in your book. Uh, I'm gonna read kind of this one extract and maybe you can expand on that a bit. And I think that, that I, I hope that this can be a kind of an entry in to, to, to a lot of what we, we will be talking about today. So you say, in a split second, the camera's shutter draws three dividing lines. In time, between a before and an after, in space, between who and what is in front of the camera and who and what is behind it, and in the body politic, between those who possess and operate such devices and appropriate and accumulate their product and those whose countenance, resources, or labor are extracted. The work of the shutter is not an isolated operation, nor is it restricted only to photography. Uh, I think that, you know, the last point you brought on going backward, on going backward, and I think you know the 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 shutter and the way you see it, kind of dividing space, time, and 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 body politic, almost kind of there is a whole construct of, of imperial temporality that you're you're playing with, and and so you know maybe not to give too much into this question, but I think is is you know when you talk about the past, you know what's <coughs> What's the, is it the past in opposition to the future? Is it the past in, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot there. So, I mean, I, I'm <laughs> gonna give that extra to you and hopefully you can... Uh, in in yeah. relation to, to the shutter itself. Exactly. So the, the aspect of time in relation to how you've described the shutter. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, you know, the shutter is very... 
uh, uh, important to the discourse of photography it is tied to the uh, device of the camera, right? With the invention of the shutter, there is the possibility to capture images, right? Because the shutter is opens up and uh, uh, close, and there is, you know, a certain amount of light that enters and, you know, record an image. Uh, modernity or about technologies as device based, right? So there is all you know, histories and uh, uh, history with the invention of the device. And they start with the invention of the device, the shutter, the shutter that enables the capture, uh, the capturing and the uh, fixing of an image. And uh, then we have, you know, a history of photography that starts, let's say, in 1839, or the revisionist history will speak about 1836 or 1837. Uh, but all these are histories of a device that uh, in themselves reiterates what I call the operation of the shutter, because they dissociate photography from other imperial technologies on which photography was built, in, uh, on which photography was modeled. So what I'm trying to do with the shutter is to say that the shutter is one of the uh, uh, major imperial technologies. Because the shutter divides, the shutter uh, separates uh, people from objects, the shutter separates the past that is being invented uh, uh, from other tenses, the shutter uh, uh, um, separates, you know, between territories, between people and lands, the shutter is a major your imperial technology it separates people from their lives in order to turn them into slaves or in, uh, uh, into refugees or into undocumented, etc. So the operation of the shutter precedes uh, 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 the invention of the camera. So what I'm trying to say by this are two things. One of them is that uh, uh, imperial technologies are predicated on the shutter. And when I'm speaking about imperial technologies, I'm speaking about technologies of expelling people from their lands. I'm speaking about technologies of reorganizing the built environment. All these are imperial technologies. They are technologies that we have to understand them not as device-based technologies, but as technologies that organize uh, 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 different elements uh, uh, in a uh, shared uh, world. Uh, so this is one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is uh, concretely about photography is that I'm dissociating photography from its modern with quotation mark uh, narrative. Because I, what I'm saying is that photography was not invented in uh, with the invention of the device, but photography was rather invented with uh, all these other technologies uh, that were sta that started to be implemented in 1492. And those technologies are, uh, are related to a certain set of rights the rights of people to go into different places and reorganize those places according to their skins. And in this sense, you know, architects, even before they graduate from, you know, uh, 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 architecture schools, architects were there, part of the imperial project from the very beginning, because they organized those spaces. What does it mean that they organized those spaces? It means that they had to destroy the syntax of different places and to impose a new one. And in this sense, they are architects. So in this sense, Architects are not, uh, you know, separated from the imperial project, but they are uh, uh, constitutive of those uh, 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 technologies, of those uh, uh, rights, etc. I, I I think that, uh, and and I'm, I'm I, I want to engage you on, on on the point of of the architects because I think that you know there is a point there, but I, I also. Uh, you know, you, 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 maybe let's start with the image itself. And I think that the image, the photographic image, and I would ask, uh, you know, in, in the midst of these technologies, you know, that, that you talked about, in the midst of, of the shutter as, as an imperial kind of technology, as a way of division, you know, how do we, how does that actually influence our reading of the photograph and, and how, you know, where, where, where do we start? You know, is it, 
maybe you know kind of what I'm asking is are, are photographs open to interpretation is it is it something that actually we you know we we we, we can face or is there something kind of or or or, or can or can we not kind of have that encounter with it so so I'm I'm you know it's it's at the level of actually grounding it from from our perspective and then kind of working our way up uh towards kind of the wider technologies, if, if, if you can kind of elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, first of all, we have to refuse the image. What do I mean by saying we have to refuse the image? We have to refuse the image as a unit. Because, you know, uh, uh, the reason that I am dislocating, you know, my engagement with photography from the device-based, you know, understanding of photography into the technology-based, you know, understanding is because once you, uh, 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 you limit yourself or you are being invited to believe that photography started in the beginning of the 19th century, you ignore that the world was organized for photography to emerge as this kind of technology. So I'm trying to link it. So this is one part of the answer, but it's just the beginning. The other more substantial part of the answer uh, that I developed in my uh, uh, previous book in Civil Imagination is the separation between the photograph, the unit, and the event of photography. Because, you know, uh, uh, we tend to say in many languages, a photographer took a photograph, right? We create this, you know, linkage between a photographer took a photograph and we assume that we uh, see the photograph. But we know very well that uh, uh, photography operates in uh, disconnected realms, right? Photographers take photographs and go, God knows what they do with them. And we encounter photographs, God knows from where they come, right? So uh, there, we have to admit that it doesn't work in a, a linear way, it doesn't work like a sequence. The photographer took a photograph and we see the photograph. So what I uh, uh, came upon with this, with understanding or this acknowledgement that these are parallel you know, realms is that actually we don't even speak about one event of photography, we speak about two. The first one is being, you know, mediated with the camera. There is a camera that comes somewhere and there is an event that takes place and there is a photograph that is being produced. First of all, we cannot reduce what happened there to the unit that we call photograph. So uh, 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 we have to keep this in mind. But this first event is an event that was mediated by the camera. The second event is an event that is mediated by the through the photograph. We encounter a photograph. So if the histories and theories of photography trained you or trained me many years ago to believe that I am coming after the event, that I am looking at a photograph of something that already took place, this invention of the past that I mentioned earlier, as you know, one of the flag, you know, uh, uh, enterprises of imperialism. So as uh, spectators, uh, as viewers of photographs, we are being trained to believe that we came after the event, but this is not true. Yeah. Once we encounter a photograph, there is an event taking place. What do I mean by that? When I see a photograph of a uh, 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 a Palestinian who is being expelled from Palestine in 48. If I accept this ideology of the documentary, this ideology of photography, if I accept all these theories of photography, I would believe that he and his struggle not to leave Palestine belong to the past. And I am coming after him when this struggle is over right? I would even be interpolated by the archive to relate to this Palestinian as a refugee, but he's not a refugee at this moment. At this moment, he's struggling not to be deported from Palestine. So we must understand that once we encounter a photograph, this is an event. This is not an interpretation. So I think that we have to change our terminology in relation to photographs. It's true that if we look together at a photograph, we may have different, you know, approach to it. You will see X, I will see Y. But we cannot reduce what we see to interpretation. We have to acknowledge that we are attending an event that it is only the ideology or the uh, uh, technology of photography that tells us that it is over. 
So in this sense, when you look at the photograph, when I look at the photograph of a Palestinian being about to be expelled from Palestine, this is for me uh, 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 an event that I am participating in. I, if I relate to him as already a refugee whose struggle uh, uh, failed, uh, uh, it means that I can turn him into my object of research and perform as a scholar of photography. But if I refuse all this ideology that goes from the archives, through the museums, through photography, through the settler colonial state, I interact with him and I join his struggle and acknowledge that his struggle is not over. So we have to understand that it is not about interpretation of the unit of photography. We have to understand what is at stake. At stake is a technology, photography, that try to seduce us to relate to imperial violence as over. And we have to resist this. I have a kind of a question that kind of relates. I mean, I, I understood how, how you just spoke about that. And if we saw the photograph as this, um, you know, it's wrong to see this photograph as this, you know, a photograph from 1948. Uh, of a Palestinian being uh, expelled from his land. It's wrong to see that as a single event because of how we look at it in the past and how we, we kind of uh, uh, remove ourselves and, and we believe that this is something that occurred in the past. But what about if we see the, 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 photog the photograph in time as, as kind of, um, I'm just trying to find the right words, but kind of, the, the, the collective photograph, um, rather than a single photograph as a single event, um, multiple photographs in time, how, how would we deal with that? And, and showing, showing the, the continuous kind of uh, repeated events, but, but seeing that the photograph, um, rather than a single event, a collective event. Uh, I don't know yes. if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, so when you start to speak about, you know, a collective event, you are starting, you know, to depart from this uh, unit, right? So you are departing from the interpretation, you are departing from all these, you know, premises of uh, good scholarship or serious scholarship with co a quotation mark that tells you, but you project this on the photograph, it is not in the photograph, as if the frame of the photograph is what should determine what you are looking at. Uh, so, uh, yes. Relating to it as, you know, one photograph in a series or relating to it as a photograph that reiterates, you know, the same uh, uh, violence or in which we can see the reiteration of the same violence over time, we are already uh, outside of the framework of interpretation and we are already in the framework of interacting with the photographed persons, not only with the history of photography or not only with the photographer as the main protagonist. So yes. Kind of expanding on that point, you, you, you bring up a point saying unlearning, unlearning is returning to the initial refusal of dispossession and the world out of which it emerged. And bringing that moment into our present rather than looking for future, but the better anti-imperialism. Which I, I mean, I, I, I personally find a lot of agency in, the, in, in that idea, but I also, you know, I in that process of unlearning, you know, as as Palestinians, uh, you know, when you have faced, I can say the the disaster that is <laughs> imposed on you by Israel, I think, and and the, and the breaking down of the social fabric. How do you how do you return to that moment? I mean, how do you how do you ultimately imagine the moment at which the photograph was taken, and 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 what tools do you kind of used to deal with that because you are you went through that process of change and and my question is you know the possibility of unlearning the potential you know what what does that kind of what does that mean in this context so uh, you know first of all saying that i am a palestinian jew is a uh, part of this process right because palestinian jew is a category that is no longer permissible right because you have either palestinians that are being considered from the point of view of 
born Israeli or born Israeli Jews are the enemies, are those who threaten their uh, uh, secure and safe life in Israel, as if Israel was not in the same place as Palestine from where Palestinians were expelled. So uh, uh, already arriving to the position where you undo this framework of the binational conflict that was imposed violently in uh, 40, from 47, 48, and created the two sides. So unlearning this means unlearning the three dividing lines that you uh, quoted earlier from my book. It's, um, it means unlearning that uh, 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 48 was a division in time that made Palestine past and Israel future. Unlearning the uh, spatial division that made you know, uh, 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 Israel the, with the, the inside and Palestinians the, out, the outside, and learning, unlearning the body politic, which made uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Jews who were born there or uh, came later, that made them uh, uh, the recognized citizens of the body politic, and turn all the other into Palestinians, which mean a threat to the body politic. So using this category of a Palestinian Jew is uh, not uh, 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 forgetting the difference between pa uh, Palestinian Muslims and Christians that were went through the Nakba and were expelled, but it is insisting on the fact that all these dividing lines create also the Jews as a side in this uh, 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 process. But let me share with you uh, a photograph. It's even not a photograph as I will explain in a minute. Do you see it? Good. So uh, this is not a photograph because when I encounter this photograph in the archive, in the International Red Cross Archive in Geneva, uh, they told me that if I want to uh, exhibit it, I have to exhibit it only with their texts, uh, which means that I was allowed uh, uh, to reiterate their interpretation with quotation mark, their understanding, their seizure of this uh, uh, photograph and what is in it and preventing me from showing it, which means preventing me from showing it in the way that I interact with it. So here we are coming back to the question of interpretation, because if each of you will go to the Red Cross archive in Geneva, you will have the right to uh, see this image. It is not an image that is being concealed or censored. So what they are trying to intervene in is in the way that we can share together this image that I will show it to you in the way that I understand it. So I call this, as I was not allowed to show the image, I call this kind of you know, drawings, I call them unshowable photographs. So once I started to create you know, photographic archives of different events, like for example, the destruction of Palestine and its replacement by uh, democratic uh, apparatuses, or, uh, uh, and, or other archives, what I started to understand is that we cannot accept that the archive consists of the material that we are being told is in the archive. We must insert placeholders in the archive. So for me, cre uh, creating or inventing these, you know, uh, onto epistemological creatures like the unshowable photograph or like the undocumented photograph or like the uh, uh, untaken photographs meant that I'm disrupting the logic of the archive. So here coming back to your question about what does it mean this unlearning? So here is the image that I referred to earlier without showing it. Here you see, you know, a man uh, kneeling, holding his uh, can and refusing to go. And his refusal to go was uh, surprising in the eyes of the uh, 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 imperial uh, Jewish uh, Zionist colonialist in uh, Palestine. Why it was surprising? Because they made a group of, I think, approximately 1,000 Palestinians sign papers, sign document that they agree to uh, uh, be reunited or repatriated with their, uh, reunited with their family already expelled to Jordan. So this guy agreed, right? He, he signed his consent, but it's only in, in, in the imperial, you know, uh, 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 imagination or imaginary or cognition that a person can sign his own, you know, uh, expulsion, expulsion. So all of a sudden, when the process, procession of uh, expellees takes place, he decides that he is not leaving. So you can see, you know, the people around him, there are many cameras around, so they are not, you know, exercising direct violence on him, but they are playing, go, go, you promised, but he's refusing. 
So the question, this raises for me all the ontoepistemological questions about photography. It's not about interpreting the photograph and speaking about his agency. It is about how we undo, how we unlearn the ideology of the documentary in a way that we recognize that this happens now. It's not from the past. This happens now. It's only the ideology that makes it to belong to the past that dissociate it from the great march of return, from, for example. Um, I hope it replies to well, that was, that your question. Was, I think... Uh, Really interesting, and I think this is in in many ways kind of I mean in 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 the way that we're kind of approaching the unit, it's it's kind of break, and I think this is something you know definitely that that you talk about a lot. It's it's how do you kind of break the externalization uh, that that the photograph creates with us, and how do we kind of become part of its space in some sense, which which. which which, which is which is uh, um, conversations about kind of uh, I'd say embrace that image and engage with it rather than kind of completely reject it, reject it and start anew, but almost let us embrace, let us engage with it in order to to reverse it, which I which I I, I think for me is, is not necessarily always intuitive, but, but is, is, is very interesting. But I also, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure if you agree with, with, with kind of this particular read, but I also, I think the archive, I, I don't know, I don't know where exactly you, you, you've mentioned this, but I do recall, I've either read the text by you or heard you once say that the archive is, is, is a building, it's an aesthetic. And, it's, and, and with that aesthetic comes, you know, the dusted filing cabinets. And with it, kind of comes the 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 uh, this image that you know there are files and drawers, and that we cannot access them. And I, I think that for me was a very kind of interesting relationship between kind of the space of the archive, but even kind of tangibly and 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 and, and in terms of its object. And so maybe I'm I would be kind of curious to hear. You know this 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 idea of preservation and, and where kind of that 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 you know the, the notion of preservation the logic of preservation within kind of imperial tactics and I think how I think this is one way where actually we can kind of start to intersect I think between between the photograph between the object and I think uh, a wider conversation on, on architecture. If yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, you know the archive is a building, but it's not only a building. And the archive, uh, we have this kind of, you know, aesthetics that I think that, you know, art institutions participate in creating these aesthetics and re reducing the archive to this kind of aesthetics. So you could see, you know, fascination with classification and, you know, as if this is the archive. But actually what I'm saying is slightly different or majorly different in the book. What I'm saying is that the archive is not just a building. We are being led, seduced to believe that it is a building that once we cross into it, we are in the archive. The archive is a technology that we encounter it all over. The fact that you can be a citizen or you can be a refugee or you can be an undocumented, this is already the stamp, the imprint of uh, 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 archival technology. So I'm speaking about the archive as a technology, as an, uh, uh, the technology, the violent technology of the archive that turns, that participate in transforming people and things into other than themselves, other than what they have been uh, prior to this imperial violence, turning them and forcing them to embody these archival categories that are being then, you know, processed in the political uh, theory discourse or processed in the museum and art history and art uh, 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 discourse. Uh, so um, we have to understand this archival technology, uh, this violent archival technology outside of the building, because if we understand the archive only uh, uh, within the frame of the building, it means that we accept 
that there are documents there that we have to unearth if we want to understand something about this regime, for example, or about the past. But as I said, I understood that the past is an invention. So rather than uh, uh, looking for the images in the archive, I am looking at different constellations when uh, uh, the documents are being produced. Uh, so if you will allow me, I will show another image. Um, okay. So this is an image, this is part of a series where I uh, uh, cover in uh, black, uh, black ink, you know, uh, many elements for different you know, reasons each time that I'm uh, intervening in a photograph in order to emphasize something. Here, what I'm emphasizing is a document. So this is, you know, for some of you who may recognize the image uh, underneath my uh, ink. This is the image where uh, uh, the uh, man who nominated himself to be the prime minister of the state of Israel at the midst of the destruction of Palestine is reading the declaration that proclaims that Israel exists and Palestine does not exist. So uh, uh, rather than, you know, uh, uh, assuming that we have to go to the archive to read documents about the declaration, I'm looking at the moment of the declaration and at the ceremonial event when this document became sacred, not only uh, in the local context, but internationally. This is the moment when other imperial uh, states recognize uh, that Israel took over Palestine, that Palestine no longer exists and Israel is from now on uh, what we have to refer to. So hence you have, you know, uh, Israeli art, you have uh, uh, Israeli theater, you have Israeli photography, you have Israeli politics, everything becomes Israeli from the moment this document is being read aloud. So I'm interested in the way that there is a continuity between the image that I showed earlier, how the body politic is being shaped through the expulsion, and there is a document that proclaims what belongs and what doesn't belong. What is inside in terms of you know, uh, spatial uh, parameters and what is outside? What is the past and what is now the future? So uh, uh, my understanding of the archive is a technology that produces documents and these documents force people and objects to embody uh, uh, what the uh, archival categories that are written in documents tell that they are. So a Palestinian is being, uh, from that moment on, there is a document that testifies that he is a refugee, or that testifies that he is an infiltrator, or that testifies that uh, our Jewish children are citizens, or to testify that this is Israel. So we have to understand the archive not as a depository of documents that we are reading and coming to interpret, but the building or the depository of the documents in continuity with other uh, uh, campaign of violence that produce these documents and that endow these documents with a kind of magic power. If they say that a person is a slave, the person is a slave. If it says that a person is a refugee, the person is a refugee. And we are compelled to relate to those people or to those objects uh, through these documents that testify that this is what they are. And just one more word. This is true not only uh, in relation to political categories that uh, uh, transform people into uh, uh, other than themselves, but also to objects, right? This is how plunder become works of art. This is how lands become private property, and on and on. In many ways, kind of, it, it throws, it throws as well kind of this concept that, that almost without consent, those involved occasionally in the, in the construction of the disaster become or, or are made complicit to that to that very memory in some sense, if I'm not mistaken. And 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 that's kind of where maybe uh, you know you, you talk about the universal right to see as as uh, is, is a fraud. And I I am kind of quite curious on on you know. Or actually, maybe I'll, I'm going to take a step back from the universal right to see as a fraud. But actually, maybe what what the you know, in some sense, we are we, we, we become part of that regime as we as we engage, as, as you as you very well mentioned. And I wonder, kind of, in in spatial parameters, what 
you believe that means in actually being a citizen in some sense or, 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 or a sovereign. And, and, and I think there, there is a paper that you shared kind of before the stock, which I would be kind of very curious to get to uh, with you here, but where you talked about the partition plan uh, and the border as kind of a frame of two spaces. And ultimately, I, you know, I, I wonder kind of how even is it, does does this kind of contract extend to citizenship? Is 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 citizenship in its very kind of essence a you know a, a a replication of of kind of this state power? Is it a perpetuation of of this kind of the work of the shutter in, in, in many in many instances? Yes, yes, definitely, yes. yes. Uh, it is. It is through, you know, these political categories, citizens and all the other categories that uh, uh, the regime perpetuates itself. Uh, so, uh, and the citizens are doing much of the work, right? Much of the work of the perpetuation because they are also oftentimes uh, exercise, you know, liberal professions, right? So they are trying from their position of citizen, uh, uh, from their position of citizen or exercising, let's say, liberal arts, they are trying to improve the world uh, 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 in which they live, right? They can even care for it and try to improve the rights of others, but they are exercising it uh, from the position of citizen. And we don't know a position of citizen that is not uh, a citizen in a uh, differential body politic. So in this sense, if we understand that each and every body politic that we know, Palestine, uh, Israel is an extreme case, but it's not the only one, right? All over the world, we have differential body politics when the composition of the body politic is made from citizens, undocumented, illegal workers, uh, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, uh, and all the rest. Uh, and all the rest, and what I'm saying, when I'm insisting on all the rest is not because I don't care to mention them, it's just to, to uh, insist that imperialism creates so many categories that even if I will, you know, uh, uh, try to uh, encompass all of them, imperialism creates more and more and more categories that uh, uh, in, enact and reenact the differentiation of the body politic. So yes, to your question, through citizenship, this uh, imperial power is being reproduced. And this is why unlearning our identities, our national uh, uh, identities, unlearning our settler colonial identities, unlearning for me, you know, uh, uh, the Israeliness that I was born to believe that I am or that I reflect or, or that I have to carry in an unavoidable way all my life, unlearning this is trying to find exit ways from empire. Doesn't mean that we succeed, you know, on an individual level, but we create an imaginary when these uh, 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 differentiations are not long, are no longer unavoidable. Um, can I ask, in reference to the last thing you showed, um, how what does the act of intervening into an image do to the audience's interpretation of it? So when I first saw it with no context, I tried to stop myself from having uh, an interpretation of it, but my my brain just naturally kind of had multiple kind uh, naturally multiple interpretations of of what it meant for the for the the humans to be to be um, that intervention of actually dribbling out the humans and highlighting that document. Um, do you have a way in which you want your audience to read your images? And, and how, how do you, you know, on that, on that idea of interpretation, like, is there, do you not want us to interpret? And I know that, that there's a connection with why you intervene and interpretation. And I kind of want to know more about that. If, yeah, so thank you. So it's not that I don't think that we read and interpret. Obviously, you know, we encounter things. So we have, you know, our readings, but we have also our emotions. 
but we have also other drives and impulses, right? So we cannot limit it to the reading or to the interpretation. And if we want to do, you know, a more uh, uh, profound work uh, 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 in our anti-colonial approach through photographs, so we have also to resist or to refuse the givenness of the frame, which means we have to use scissors, we have to use ink, we have to use zoom in, zoom out on our uh, computer. We have to juxtapose images. We must uh, 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 refuse what is being given to us as a given, which means we must, ex we must exercise, we must experiment, not for the sake of experimentation, but because uh, it's not only the unit of the photograph that is, uh, 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 acts so strongly on us. Everything acts very strongly on us, and, right? And everything is entangled. So in order to resist, we cannot just resist with interpretation because there are so many layers to it. The three dividing lines that we have already spoke about, the ideology of all the disciplines that we are part of, right? As artists, as architects, as archeologists, as uh, phys physicians, as citizens. So I think that we cannot just, you know, uh, interpret gently what we see, because if we just gently interpret what we see, we accept without knowing even so many of the premises of empire. So using, you know, ink, using tapes, using scissors, high cat, <laughs> very, very acrobatic. Ah. Uh, so this is part of uh, the refusal to use this. Uh, and, you know, coming from, you know, I have two hats, more or less, you know, one of them is political theory, the other one is scholar of photography. So, you know, coming from, you know, the realm of photography and working for many, many years with photographers who are taking what is called the documentary with uh, quotation mark and the sacredness of the frame. Uh, they, they will not touch it and they will even, you know, enlarge what they print on the paper to see that they didn't cut the image because they feel like they must respect the frame. So after, you know, uh, being part of this world for many, many years, it's also unlearning this sacredness because it imposes on us so many things that we are being asked to accept. So, you know, uh, using our uh, ink, uh, tracing, drawing, juxtaposing, cutting, cropping, because when you crop an image, all of a sudden you see tons of details. You couldn't see them before. When you trace an image, you, all of a sudden so close to the photographed person that you see detail with which you interact that you couldn't interact earlier. So I don't know if it replies to your question, but uh, yeah, I, I, it is I not random. Yeah. We, have, we have a question from, from the audience actually, which, which is a follow up yeah. on this one. Uh, and then maybe I can kind of ask that. I have, I have two more questions and we can open up, I think, to, to everyone. Yeah. But she, she asks, how do you make sure you do not produce the logics as you cut into the frame? How to uncork, how to uncork and unlearn the logics? Uh, I cannot make sure. I mean, I'm not an insurance company, but the only way that I can, you know, correct if I did a mistake is by you asking me or telling me, maybe you shouldn't do this, maybe you should that, do that. So in this sense, for me, you know, showing images, sharing them with others, uh, uh, inviting people to speak and coming to these different forums just to speak with people is creating the opportunity for us to tune, you know, ourselves in relation to what we are doing in a way that we also correct each other. So there is no insurance that what I'm doing is right. But in the process of, you know, trying to unlearn in a very uh, uh, systematic way, my pos the positions that I was trained to inhabit, like the citizen or like the uh, 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 scholar in the academia or like the curator or like the artist. So I'm doing and unlearning these positions. This is part of my process. It may be that it will work for others to use some of these techniques because you know it's not about techniques it is how at a certain moment each and every technique can work for you to uh, unpack a little bit what you feel like works on you a spell even that you want to uh, disentangle and it can be that you take a risk and someone will tell you no but this is unacceptable what you did 
So there is, you know, an opportunity there to say, okay, maybe I was wrong or maybe I was right. Let's see how we deal with this afterlife of violence because this imperial violence will not disappear because I change an image, will not disappear because you will tell me to do it this way or that way. The question is how we understand the multi-layers, you know, of, uh, of uh, 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 the, the way that th these technologies work. That was a very yeah. nicely articulated response. Yes, especially um, for, for, for how we're seeing it with our unit. You know, it's, it's not these tools aren't aren't there and you use them, but it's it's because how do you make these tools, you know, do what you what you want them to do? It's it's not just uh, me using it. Yeah. Uh, I have I have a question on 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 architecture here. Uh, in, in because um, you know there, there's an equation here that that we're talking about I think between between the photographer and the architect as part of kind of the imperial technologies that exist. I think the distinction to my mind is is you know with architecture, I, I, I won't say that photography is not tangible, but there is a very kind of material transformation of landscapes that's that that's happening there. There's a, there's a, there is a scale of intervention that actually you know is 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 not is not only in memory but it's that you can actually see the kind of the physicality of that scar and 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 and, and i think you, you talked about the production of the desert and the greening of the desert and in kind of the 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 you know how kind of israel operates and, and i wonder if if you have you know if you see if if kind of if, if there are differences in actually how that particular unlearning process uh, happens in, in your mind I'm not sure that I got the, uh, the question. I understood what you said, but I didn't understand what you asked me. If I, what I, how do I see the role of the architect within it? Or How, how you see the, the going backwards in confrontation with architecture happening, if, if, if that... So, you know, there are some uh, brilliant, you know, architectural projects uh, uh, done by, you know, uh, decolonizing architecture, which is Sandy Lala, Sandro Petty and Ayal Weizmann. And there is what Dara are doing, which is Sandy Lal and Alessandro Petty. Uh, uh, so there are, you know, uh, there is what Leopold Lambert is doing, what Samia Hen is doing. I mean, you have, you know, in your uh, uh, vicinity, uh, many people who engage, uh, you know, with what does it mean to unlearn it when it comes to architecture. Um, so, I mean, really, uh, you can learn a lot from them. I'm interested uh, uh, in it also in the way that it is entangled with uh, uh, with other professions. So maybe I'll share the screen again and I will show one of the images. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, Samia Henny wrote uh, a brilliant book uh, on uh, uh, the way that the French state uh, during the colonization of Algeria used architecture in order to colonize. And the way that she writes about it is trying to understand, you know, uh, how, to, uh, uh, how it can be resisted, opposed, uh, et cetera. So she invited me, she did a very interesting conference on uh, uh, toxicity, toxicity. I don't know if you, this is how you say it in English, never mind. And uh, coloniality in the in relation to the desert. And I told her when she invited people to invite rather than me. And she insisted, okay, so I insisted also and asked myself, where I can, uh, how can I approach this question? And uh, I was finally grateful to uh, Samia that invited me to think about it because I realized that actually when saying that I'm not working on desert, I responded, you know, from the scientific with quotation mark approach to the desert, right? That the desert is this barren, dry land and I'm not working on it, I'm working on other things. And it pushed me to think, what does it mean this sentence of blooming the desert, right? That is so common in the narratives, the Zionist narratives about Palestine. And uh, uh, I was interested, you know, to understand how the desert was created. So rather than, you know, looking at the desert and asking myself, did I do any work on the desert? No, questioning this category of the desert, because actually Israel created the desert all over, right? Uh, uh, it created all over the desert in order to bloom it. 
because Israel didn't bloom with quotation mark, it made bloom only the ne Nakeb, the Negev, but the entire Palestine. So I understood that I have to speak about the desert, about the desert effect. So I have to speak about the creation of the desert that had to be, uh, to be uh, uh, bloom. So I understood that the desert is actually a buffer in order to change everything into desert, uh, uh, you have to uh, 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 actually create different type of only so I want to. He was uh, a fixer. Uh, an architect was contacted by uh, the prime minister and listen to what I'm saying, architect, prime minister, so it's not only citizens, refugees, expellees, these are also these positions. So a prime minister contacts, uh, contacted uh, an architect and invited him to prepare uh, the plan for Israel. There is a book by Tzvi Efrat called, I think, uh, The Zionist Project that deals uh, uh, with this plan. Uh, so here what you see, you know, is the image of the desert, right? You see an image of the desert. So you have a photographer also, prime minister, architect, photographer, who is producing the desert. Because, you know, when you have 90,000 uh, Bedouin living in the desert in 47, 48, this is not how the desert looked like. In order to produce this image, the photographer had to produce the desert, right? But we relate to it as a documentary, as a scientific, you know, account of the desert. But this is the production of the desert. So even in the desert itself, in the Nakeb, we see how the desert is being produced. Because at that moment, there are 90,000 Bedouin living in the desert. So it doesn't look like this. There is an intention to produce the desert that way. So here you can read some of the, you know, uh, the literature that accompanied uh, these images. So uh, uh, the architect doesn't work alone. It, where he or she work, you know, with photographers, with prime ministers, with the militaries who expelled people in order for the desert to look like this, etc. Uh, but what I was interested in also is, you know, the city where I was born. I was born here in Natania. There was nothing more obvious than Natania. But, you know, in retrospect, I remember that when I was a child, my mother used to take me to visit her friend, and she worked in the clinic of Umkhaled. But Umkhaled was not a clinic, right? Umkhaled, the house of the clinic, was the house of the sheikh, and uh, uh, Umkhaled was actually uh, uh, a thriving Palestinian village. But as a child, it didn't occur to me because there was this clinic called Umkhaled where my mother's friend worked. So this is the uh, city where I was born. And you know, when you are interested in the history of uh, uh, your places, you would see desert, even if it is not a desert. You see the dune, there is nothing, right? Let's go to another image. This is, by the way, the map. Zoom Khaled. This is Netanya, where I was born. But this is the pre-4748 uh, map, because Netanya, where I was born, was already including, included Khaled, right? The effect meant that uh, prior to the creation of the desert, Israeli localities are uh, uh, like, you know, uh, um, I don't have the, ter the right term, but uh, 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 adhere to Palestinian villages all over the country in a way that when the partition plan was, you know, announced, the violence came from all over and each locality took the nearby lo Palestinian locality and made it its own. So this is what happened in uh, Natania. But I, this is not what I was about to tell you. What I was about to tell you is that, again, you continue to look at the images uh, of your own city, the history, if you accept that there is such a history that, uh, that you know, is the uh, 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 history in the sense of the archive. And what you see is really nothingness. And out of the nothingness, slowly, slowly, there are houses, right? So this is another image where I uh, uh, turn the uh, people into figures, into personas in this imperial you know, narrative. So here are the workers who build Natania. I don't know their identity, but they may not all of them be Zionist. 
Some of them may still be, you know, uh, 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 Palestinians who were kept in order to do this kind of labor, right? Uh, so I'm looking at uh, them in this landscape. And then, as you could see, Natania was not these, uh, this desert, these dunes, because Natania had to be produced in these images as, you know, uh, 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 where is the previous image? as you know, the nothingness out of which Natania grew up as part of the Zionist project. And if you will look at this image, you would see that Natania, which on Khaled became its history, this is how the history is being invented, was not nothingness. You could see here an entire village, even more than a village, a town. And this is an image that was taken uh, 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 where, you know, there are already tents and soldiers and uh, 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 the Nakba is uh, uh, at its uh, 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 moment of uh, taking care of being unfolded. So uh, coming back to the desert and to different type of soils, what I understood is that not only the desert was uh, 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 invented and produced, as I show in the first images of the uh, plan for Israel. But if you look again here, I'm not interested in who are these, you know, soldiers who destroyed uh, Um Khaled. Uh, I'm not interested, I mean, in their uh, uh, individual identities. I'm interested in their role. They are now destroying Um Khaled and they are producing the land of the desert, the soil of the desert. This is the soil of the desert in Palestine. Right? This is the soil of the desert because you remove the people, you destroy the architecture, you destroy the built environment, and it becomes another type of soil. So when we are speaking about the soils of the desert, I think that as long as we will relate only to the dry uh, uh, with some you know, climatic trait as the desert, we are ignoring the production of the desert uh, in this way. So the production of the desert by the photographer, by the architect, by the military, and then later on by the children who are uh, being you know, trained to believe that they came out of uh, the desert. I, I, I can go on, but I'm very wary that I, I want to give an opportunity for the... For, but actually, I mean, I think this is a perfect note to end on because it, it, you know, you, you, I think it ties in everything together. Uh, I mean, uh, should we start by, by reading from, from the chat a few questions and then, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ariella. That was, that was a wonderful, I mean, that was a, that was a painful end to not on, but end on, but I think a very kind of comprehensive summary. Uh, so I'll read some of the questions from the chat. We, we um, in, in the process. I'm not sure which one's first. Maybe we can start with, with Marek, if she maybe wants to unmute, unmute herself. Uh, uh, we, uh, you want to raise your hand, Marek? Or we can uh, see. Ah, yeah. Hey, Marek, you're on. Hello, hi. Thanks so much for discussion, very, very much interesting. Uh, I have just one quick question about uh, a learning process. So we are discussing that uh, this environment and architecture also is unavoidable. And uh, in uh, terms of unlearning in process, what can be unavoidable? Uh, I mean, uh, what risks does it can take in this process? What we can lose and what we can gain? Uh, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I understood it, so let me try to see if I understood it, because uh, one of my assumptions is that imperialism, by creating the past and by destroying like the desert effect, etc., create things as unavoidable. Uh, but I think that we have to question everything that is being made as unavoidable, including architecture, right? It's not unavoidable that we have to... Uh, 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 destroy buildings that we are being told are going to fall to uh, being tear apart, torn apart, right? Because there is something about, we have to understand it about, you know, uh, uh, destruction and about construction that destroy not only the structures. With each and every place that is being destroyed, 
violently like Palestine, but gently or uh, with a progressive approach, with progressive architectural approach, like we will provide them with better facilities to keep, to preserve their uh, museal objects, or we will provide them with better facility to digitize their images. Something is being destroyed. And what is being destroyed are oftentimes, you know, uh, uh, things that we have to adhere to them, not to let them be destroyed because they carry much more than what is in them because imperialism destroyed so much. So we don't have to let more and more structures to be replaced because in those structures, even if they were created by imperialism, they carry uh, uh, the imprint of those against whom uh, uh, they were created. So this idea of uh, that motivates sometimes as unavoidable architects to come up with new solutions, how to uh, tear apart, apart you know, neighborhood in order to come up with new ones uh, uh, is not unavoidable. But I'm not sure that what I'm answering is what you ask. So correct me if I went in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, yes, it's 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 the, it's following my question. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, so this unavoidable, uh, like the understanding of unavoidable, is uh, the result of uh, violence or kind of violence and aggressiveness or uh, the result of misunderstanding like uh, like when we see the photo photograph for example we may not un understand it as it was taken and uh, like um, what was the reason to take it uh, yeah so yes so th thank you for clarifying this this is very important distinction and uh, unavoidable is not about misunderstanding uh, we can misunderstand, but then we later we understand better if we do the effort. The unavoidable is a technology. When uh, uh, it's a technology that moves you forward, it's a technology that tells you there is no other way. We must go on, right? There, a place was destroyed. You must try to come with solutions how to remove the rubbles and build a new one. So the unavoidable is not an individual. Uh, uh, um, understanding or interpretation. The unavoidable is a technology. It is unavoidable, right? I was born Israeli, and when I'm telling, you know, friends and family, but I am not an Israeli. I am a Palestinian Jew. But you cannot choose for yourself, right? Because Palestine is gone and Israel is there, and you cannot say that you are not, right? Uh, uh, or all the other places when you say, no, but don't destroy this. And people tell you, but it's, it crumbles, it, this structure will fall apart, or these people need better conditions, right? So you impose on them something that is newer, something that is allegedly more hygienic, more, uh, 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 um, more advanced in terms of uh, uh, technologies of lives, etc. But actually you participate in making the unavoidable unavoidable. So we contribute to the unavoidability of uh, uh, the unavoidability, but we can refuse. But it's not about misunderstanding, because the unavoidable is, uh, uh, the, let's say, the software of this technology that I described as the three dividing lines. The three dividing lines is a technology. It separates past from future. It tells Palestine past, Israel is the future. Uh, uh, Native Americans past, uh, 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 the US is the future, right? This is not the future, the present and the future because everything goes on with the US. So it separates past from present or past from other tenses. It separates territories from others and tells this belongs to the US uh, and it's uh, differentiated about the politic. This is the technology of the unavoidable. We can refuse on so many levels, but uh, it's not a question of misunderstanding. So thank you for raising it and for letting me the opportunity to uh, articulate this. We have a question from Jean. Uh, maybe I think it's better if we, if we have you on mute yourself. Thank you so much for your really important work and presentation. I just. Um, want to follow up the earlier question um, that I asked was just that 
I'm very interested in the, in the two events um, of the shutter and then the encounter. And I'm thinking about, you know, as a subject, um, you know, if, if one thinks of flesh drives unconscious desire, for instance, how we, the body becomes, um, incarnates the logic of imperialism. So I just wonder whether you think that the encounter with the event, the second event, or maybe both events, um, because I'm thinking of all the work that's been done on what is an event um, in itself, that encounter with the event, event actually has the potential to unwork or unlearn the flesh, the drives, the unconscious desire, you know, to unwork that logic that um, the body has and the unconscious and the psyche and the psychosomatic body that speaks, in other words, has come to incarnate. You know, how to unwork that logic. And I know it's something to do with that second event, how you name it, what you extract from it, how you have some fidelity to it, how you then put the work in to transform it and what you subtract over time in relation to it. That's my question. Yes, yeah, so I think it's part of, you know, the answer to your question was already in your questions. You have to work hard because you don't not always, you know, encounter an event uh, uh, because, you know, if you inhabit the position of the viewer of a photograph and you just interpret the photograph, there is no event. There is, you know, you are uh, uh, acting your role as a reader, as a scholar, and you read the photograph and you moved on to read another one or to read other people who interpret this photograph. But once you understand your uh, 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 possibilities to interact with uh, uh, the photograph in a different way, you are uh, uh, setting, you are uh, participating in uh, uh, the, putting the event uh, 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 in march, let's say, uh, in uh, letting the event or setting the event, you know, going, because a photograph can sit in a drawer and there is no event. So the question is how, when we encounter a photograph, especially I'm speaking about, you know, catastrophically produced photographs, photographs, you know, produced under the imperial condition. When you encounter these photographs is the question is how you are not only looking at it from the position that is being given to you, but how you uh, 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 interact with the protagonists, the photograph persons, those who are not in the frame, the photographer, and uh, uh, what does it mean about yourself viewing this photograph from where you are? Because we tend to look at these photographs taken in places of disaster as we are looking at the disaster of others. But the question is, what does it mean about you as a viewer looking at this photograph and how you can unfold the event, participate in the event that will bring you to you? And I think that, I don't know you, it's not, I'm not uh, referring to you in what I'm going to say, but this event takes place in the way that it takes place, you know, uh, be, uh, outside of the screen, but it takes place in Britain and Britain as uh, the UK has a very important role and UK citizens is a, have a very important role in unlearning and in undoing and in transforming and repairing the disaster that they left in Palestine. Because with all the critique that I have against the Zionists, we cannot exclude all the other protagonists that destroyed Palestine. And uh, uh, UK has an important role. So viewing these images, for example, from the UK, is not something that happened to Palestinians. It is something that also happened to uh, British, uh, 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 to uh, British, right? It happened to British. The fact that they don't do not understand this as a disaster that they produced is it means that they are still uh, 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 didn't start uh, 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 the processes of unlearning. But Palestine is a Britain uh, 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 disaster in the same way, in a different way, but in a similar way that it is the disaster of Palestinians. This is the disaster of Jews who became Zionists and many other protagonists that let the destruction of a place and the construction of a different one at, it, at its place uh, to happen. And until today to continue to perpetuate the same campaign of violence. Uh, 
So I think that, uh, 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 yes, it's a bodily uh, embodied event, it's, uh, uh, but it's something that we cannot participate in as if it happened to others. So the question is always, and I wanted to say that already earlier, Jumana, in relation to what you asked me, but I now cannot recall what was the, the question, but it is also always about how do we bring it to ourselves? Uh, uh, and how we make it part of what we think as thinker, as scholars, as architect, because it's not something that happened to others. Others pay a higher price. Others uh, suffered it more painfully. But this imperial world, we are all operating on a daily basis. We have a question from... Well, thank you, thank you for that answer. We have, we have a question from... From Mina. Uh, Mina, do you want to raise your hand? Hi. <laughs> Hi. So, um, it was really interesting to you know, listen to your work and everything. And um, I had like one quick question and then another one that I think it's somewhat related to Mara's question. Mm, so one of them was that, um, like based on I guess my own interpretation of what you you were saying, that borders are are kind of the the hard borders that we have now are almost like an imperial country, and I'm wondering if they didn't exist, would would the photograph or the shutter have the same effect that it has not, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let's reverse it. Uh, it is the shutter, the operation of the shutter that create the borders. So uh, uh, we, you know, uh, the world didn't have borders in the way that we understand mm -hmm. it today. Communities, you know, add their you know, own syntax, their own modalities of life, their own self-understanding, but they were always, you know, in connection with different uh, other communities, right, without mm -hmm. borders, because there was mm -hmm. a self-understanding that, you know, they are having their own, you know, uh, 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 political formation, social formation, religious formation, uh, uh, etc. It doesn't mean that there were no wars. But wars mm -hmm. were not about borders, were about, you know, other things. So the creation, the imposition of the borders uh, together with uh, 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 the liberal logic of private property, of nationality, of individual identity, etc., are the embodiment or are the outcome of the operation of the shutter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm, that's interesting, but hard to, hard to grasp. <laughs> Mm. And then I, ha I also have another question, which is you that... can speak a little bit louder because I can barely hear you. Uh, sorry, is is it better now? Yeah, now it's better. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so, um, I I I feel like so basically the the photograph and the shutter which creates the border, similar to how architects or like us we we kind of operate um, and it's all about like controlling the, the point of view. But how do we, how do we still do what we do without, without imposing our point of view or without telling a specific story? Um, you know, is that possible? I thought. Yeah. Uh... So, you know, I can only say very uh, broad things is mm -hmm. one of them, uh, uh, you cannot undo imperialism on your own. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't think that in what you're going to do, imperialism is going to uh, crumble the day after. Uh, but yeah. whatever you are doing is very important in order to uh, 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 transform the infrastructures of imperialism. Uh, uh, so this is one, you know, broad uh, thing. We cannot believe that what we are doing individually is uh, uh, what's going to change the world tomorrow. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, we must uh, uh, reduce 
the violence that uh, we are exercising through our oppositions. And how to do this, there are many, you know, ways that people have already engaged with it, right? So you can learn from them and you can, uh, the first thing that you uh, can do is whenever you see that you are in a position where you can impose your point of view, speak with the others that uh, your point of view is going to affect uh, uh, their life. So, uh, uh, and uh, there are, you know, many ways to conceive even architecture in a different communal way rather than uh, uh, imposition top down. Uh, but I'm sure that your professors know how to uh, direct you mm -hmm. to better, uh, you know, places where to find these kind of engagements. Uh, but we have to understand we were all born into an imperially crafted world. Mm -hmm. The question is how to reduce the violence that we are exercising. And this is already a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and one day, hopefully in our life, we will attend at the collapse of racial capitalism and imperialism. But until then, we have to reduce the violence that we are uh, allowed to exercise through our different uh, positions of power and position of knowledge. Um, in many ways, the, I mean, like the practice kind of you see on the ground in the last uh, two months in Sheikh Jarrah, for example, and those kind of models of photography have already kind of done so much to challenge the shutter. And I think that we kind of, we, we see it happening. We have, we have one, and then we're to photographer. We, we have one, one last uh, question, I think, from Iman Haram, and, and then we can uh, wrap up after that. Um. Uh, great talk. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Uh, great, great uh, talk. Absolutely uh, brilliant. And uh, Ariella, I am a photographer and I'm also a, a historian of photography. And what struck me about what you said, um, uh, it's embedded in my practice because I find there's enormous agency in intervening with the, uh, what's deemed archival photograph because it turns you from a passive receiver to a protagonist in shaping the narrative that it's not foreclosed and that you can um, actually um, reject, uh, re-narrate, and, and, and it's like it's something part of continuum. I have a question for you about permission. Um, people in the past, sometimes I take archival photographs without asking permission because I find that I don't want to take permission from anyone when I was, nobody took permission for me to photograph or steal my country. So what do you think of the notion of permission when you're accessing archival photograph and what, uh, how do you um, relate to this notion of being given the right to intervene as opposed to saying, no, I don't want you to give me the right, I want to take it, I want to intervene. So thank, the, you. Thank, thank you, thank you for this question, uh, Iman. So, uh, you know, in the example that I showed from the uh, uh, International Red Cross Archive in Geneva, they didn't give me right, right? So I took my right and I'm still showing you the image and I showed it in many places and I will continue to show it, not as a photograph, but as a drawing, but I don't call it a drawing because I insist that this is the way that I can share with you a photograph which is the unshowable photograph. So this is one example, and there are uh, several examples, you know, in the potential history in the book that I uh, published last year, where I didn't ask permission from any archive. What I did is intervening in different images in a way that I am saying that the event of photography has so much more information in it than what is inscribed in one photograph, and I am producing another rendering, another outcome out of this event through these kind of drawings or tracing or covering a part of the information. So I agree with you completely uh, uh, that we don't have to ask uh, always rights from archives because archives are built on looted material. Uh, they didn't ask your permission to be photographed. They didn't ask permission from all the uh, people that, uh, you know, they hold their photographs. And by the way, they oftentimes didn't even ask permission from the photographers to own their photographs. So mm -hmm. all this is really fraud. And uh, uh, yeah, we have to find ways to negotiate this system of rights because this system of rights are part of the imperial rights that impose on you uh, that you have to ask for permission from what was uh, expropriated from you. Mm -hmm. It's even, even in a film, sometimes I'm finding myself photographing from films that an Israeli filmmaker has right access to archives that I don't have access to. 
So I'm actually appropriating it by photographing from footage of his film what I should have access to as a way of intervening also. So um, let's, let's articulate it not only as what you are doing and what I am doing. Let's say that on a larger scale, Palestine Remember, Bravo to Palestine Remember, is a site where all the photographs that uh, mm. for which, you know, people are asking rights from Israeli archives are there. So you can always quote them from Palestine Remember, and they are doing an incredible job of making all this, you know, uh, 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 accessible to many others without asking uh, uh, rights from mm -hmm. these archives. And I think that it's important uh, uh, to understand that these kind of uh, 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 tactics that we are using, that you are using, that I'm using, that we didn't coordinate, that we are using them, and Palestine, remember, is doing it on a larger scale. We have to understand this as, you know, moments of going on strike against the archive. Brilliant. You don't coordinate that something is wrong necessarily with others. Yeah. It's nice when you can coordinate because you feel empowered. Uh, but you see that it comes from many different places, which means something is fraud with these systems. Something is, uh, uh, the imperial violence is being continuously exercised through this system of copyright that is the prerogative of those who impose this violence. So we always I mean, have to remind ourselves that we are not alone and we are part of yes. the bigger struggle. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Optimistic note. Uh, I think that, that uh, you've given us a lot to, and I think a lot to kind of uh, reflect on. And, and I think a lot of hope in some sense in, in the way that you've talked about things. So, so I, I, uh, I really appreciate it. And it, was, it was an honor to have you and, and our pleasure. So thank you so much. I don't know if you have any thank kind you. of- Thank you. Thank you, Khaled and Jumana for inviting me. It was great talking with you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.